For millennia, man has faced a quandary. The desire to hit someone. But they're really far away. This has led progressively to the development of the throne rock, the throne pointy rock, the far throne rock, the really far throne rock, the flying pointy rock on a stick, the refined pointy rock on a stick, the spicy refined rock powered by fire, and by the end of World War II the happy fun times refined spicy rock transported by Big Metal Bird. In the early 1940s Japan was pondering what was for them the latest iteration of this age-old problem. In this case the USA was a long way away to the east, and no Japanese aircraft had the range to reach it, even from the most recently captured islands. Likewise the Japanese fleet could not sail across the Pacific and back again in any great strength, and the US Navy and US Army Air Force, let alone the coast defence guns that were in the more vulnerable locations, would of course be at their strongest at the USA's own shoreline. Admiral Yamamoto saw a potential solution. Some of the Japanese Navy's larger current submarines carried a scout aircraft, and if they could replace this with an aircraft capable of carrying bombs and or torpedoes, then a submarine could sneak close to the US coast, launch an air raid, and then sneak away again. However, such an aircraft would need to be larger and more powerful than a recon aircraft to carry the payload, and this would need a lo longer launch catapult and hangar, and that would in turn mean a bigger submarine. And as the submarine would need to travel at least twice across the Pacific, and ideally further so as to have reserves of fuel and allow it to use an indirect course, it would also need to carry a huge amount of fuel, which would again increase its size. And at that point it would have reached a scale where the carriage of multiple aircraft would be possible. The outline of the idea was sorted by early 1942, and in January 1943 construction began on what was to be the largest submarine ever built, until someone decided to cram happy fun time refined spicy rocks into submarines in the 1960s. The I-400 class would displace about 3,500 tonnes on the surface, and just over 5,200 tonnes when submerged, with a combined diesel and electric power plant allowing the sub to reach just under 19 knots from 10,000 shaft horsepower on diesels, or just over 6 knots submerged from 4,200 shaft horsepower via the electric batteries. All of which was transmitted via two screws. The sub was armed with a single 5.5 inch deck gun, three triple and one single 25mm anti-aircraft gun installations, and a forward spread of eight Type 95 torpedoes. However, the 400 foot long craft was mainly supposed to utilise the three Aichi M6A1 Siran aircraft which were carried in the hangar. The superstructure was a little bit odd. The bulk of it was the hangar, which was slightly offset to starboard, whilst the bridge-conning tower was offset well to port. The sub was wide enough that the pressure hull was also not the tapered cylinder of typical subs, but rather a double type with a sideways figure of eight shape for much of its length. Initially, some modification of the D4Y Judy bomber was to be used as the aircraft, but it turned out to be not possible to modify the aircraft to fit, and the Specialist M6A1 was developed instead. Whilst slower and lower flying than the D4Y, in part due to the fact it had to lug floats around, the Siren could range out to just over 700 miles, which should be enough to ensure the submarines were far off the US coast, and thus relatively safe from immediate retribution. The plan was to have 18 submarines built allowing for an air raid of dozens of aircraft, but whilst I-400 through I-404 were started, only the first two would be completed in time to see any service in World War II, with I-402 completing just as the war was ending. By the time I-400 and I-401 were in service, the war was in a very different place to what it had been in 1942, and the original aim of just bombing the USA with conventional munitions was off the table. Instead, the idea was now to try and blow up the Panama Canal locks to make the movement of ships and men from the Atlantic and Mediterranean much more difficult. The war in Europe was ending, and the Japanese Navy knew that many Allied reinforcements would be inbound via this route. Because the attack would only get one chance, the Siran aircraft were modified into kamikazes to ensure the greatest chance of success. 
But the war deteriorated even faster than preparations could be made, and the objective was switched to a surprise kamikaze attack on the much more present US fleet carriers which had assembled at the forward base of Ulithi, with the aircraft even painted to look like US aircraft in order to try and maximise the hesitation of any patrolling US fighters or US anti-aircraft gunners. This assault was to be followed by a biological weapons strike on the continental United States in September 1945, but the war ended whilst the subs were still at sea on their way to Ulithi, and thus neither attack was actually launched. The subs were duly taken into American custody, but with shades of the Cold War already kicking off, they were very quickly examined and then scuttled less than a year after the war ended in order to prevent the Soviet Union getting access to them and potentially getting any ideas. The wrecks would be rediscovered in 2005 and 2013 respectively, albeit somewhat the worse for wear having been hit by torpedoes and then hit the bottom rather hard. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.